This is Critical Nonsense, our high lowbrow show about culture, science, and tech. This week, special guest Katie Sadow joins us to talk about curation versus creation and our ideal pasta shapes. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Joey. <laughs> this is what the Joey sounds like. Uh, it's French. I'm thinking of <laughs> Muzzy. Um, this is what executive producer and newly dubbed Shade Queen Jess Vander sounds like. Hi, this is Jess. And this is what the curious story of a cat lady in Katsachusetts, Katie Sadow, our guest host, sounds like. <laughs> Je suis la jeune fille. That was a Muzzy <laughs> reference. Hi, yeah. this is Katie. Um, deux, toi. <laughs> um, if you don't know what Muzzy is, probably better, but also means that you're of a certain age, I think. It's like you're... the opposite of what of a certain age means. <laughs> no, it's like of a certain middle age now, I think, unfortunately. Oh, right. It's not like old of a certain age it is like it's too young if you're gen, if you're gen z you've 100 percent never heard of muzzy and if you're a boomer you've 100 percent probably not heard of muzzy unless you happen to have bought it for your kids so it is like i was gonna say that's what boomers definitely know about muzzy because we weren't buying it for ourselves <laughs> yeah but it was being advertised on like nickelodeon that's true um just do we have any housekeeping no you can find the podcast on YouTube now as well, if that's a thing that you were extremely desirous of. Um, it's available. Search it. Uh, we also have our weekly newsletter. You can find it at progressbysylvain.co. Sign up. It's wonderful. Jess had a great contribution this week. I'm not going to spoil it. Just leave it as a cliffhanger. Katie also <laughs> did the illustrations this week. You should go download it. Jess, yeah. you're, you're like, you look like you just ate a fart. Thanks. You're faced. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to think about <clears throat> what I could say of the three of us both being here and being on the newsletter, and I couldn't come up with anything good. And so here we are. <laughs> so here we are. Um, that's housekeeping. No corrections department this week because everything was correct last week, I guess. <laughs> also, congrats, Joey, on your talk. We'll add yeah. a link to the show notes about it. Yeah, that's also on the YouTube page. You'll be able to watch that if you want to see me talk about cognitive diversity and move my arms way too much. Just like I told never you, stops I moving. I think you're just animated. You're an animated yeah. speaker. Just Don't animated. apologize for being you. All so right. generous. This is not what we're here to talk about. Katie? <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you've been thinking about. What have I been thinking about? What have I been eating? The answer is always pasta. True. This week, extra, because over the weekend, in a sort of... Um, a bout of spring cleaning accompanied by emptying out my podcast feed. I listened to the Planet Money episode covering uh, Sporkful, the, the podcast The Sporkful's host Dan Pashman's creation of a brand new pasta shape, Cascatelli, the Italian word for waterfall, which he developed after years as a food industry commentator and consumer, um, having realized that he had been participating in the ecosystem of the food realm without contributing anything tangible. And so he decided that he would take his sort of hot takes and expertise, mix them together into a buoyant dough and create something, namely a new pasta. Um, and it sort of it sparked this question around um, the relative value of contribution versus creation. This is a, a very Malcolm Gladwell 
question. Come on. Katie. Keep it out of here. Like that. Leave it alone. <laughs> um, you, you take that and you <laughs> You can just go. <laughs> Who's yeah, the shade queen me. now? Uh, <laughs> um <laughs> I I mean, I think this is really interesting because there is like this weird caste system that I think exists within the world of content creators. Namely, I I guess I'm thinking about like online content creators versus, you know, whether we make a distinction of when something becomes art and maybe like films and television don't necessarily fall into this. Although I think they have their own cast system too. Historically, like television was lesser than feature length films and that seems to be getting upended. But it within the online like content creator world, you hear these words thrown around with derision sometimes, right? Like I know, um, you know, the bigger names within certain categories will throw around the word like, oh, this is going to get picked up by the aggregators, right? Like in, in sports, like Bill Simmons, if he talks about something, even if it's just like a question where he's like, oh, what if this person got traded here? Aggregators will pick it up and he's like, Bill Simmons said this person's going to get traded. And so there is this caste system between who is aggregating versus who is creating net new things. Also, you may hear Emerson today. Um, but I think that idea of like, when does something move from being part of the conversation to being a contribution is really interesting. And in this case, it seems like Dan Pashman was thinking about like, what's my legacy within food? Like my show probably will not live on forever, but maybe like a pasta shape could. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, even just you starting to talk about this is triggering another line of thought for me related to the sort of caste system structure. It's making me think about um, all the sort of reporting that I had encountered uh, around Bon Appetit, especially as it relates to the missteps and sort of um, unhealthy workplace environment that was existing there. But like in that environment, and honestly, in the food world, generally creators are lower um, on the Mm -hmm. totem pole, you know, sort of like you don't see the cooks um, and chefs are honestly often perceived more as curators than as creators. There's like And then in the editorial world, it's the people who are writing the articles about the food that they are consuming who are lauded generally much more publicly than recipe writers or um, recipe testers. And so I think Mm -hmm. it makes me think that it's kind of cool to see someone who is existing in a – who was existing in a purely purely curatorial and sort of commentator realm – moving as as like a show of um i don't know what a show moving into creation as an act of like respect for the field you know Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely it's it's interesting too that that was his inclination given what you're saying about like food food as medium and therefore the way that that then defines the, the cast order in that industry like it almost perhaps felt like he had jumped ahead to the privilege line of like I'm right. a curator in food and so I in in order to but like like what have I made prove myself exactly like I in order to have earned the credibility to get to that echelon I should you know show that I can sweep the floors a little bit because that's what is given you know that that is in some ways is what earns people respect in that industry yeah, there, there's something about, like, canon, right? Like, what have you added to the canon? Where, like, uh, whoever invented, you know, spaghetti or, or, like, these other shapes of pasta for him because he values pasta so much that 
for him to leave something there that is more permanent is really interesting. And I think that same thing probably holds true. I really like the point that you made about the creators. There is like this weird gap between like the everyday creators who are sort of making it possible for us to eat good food and interesting food versus the people who are at the top of like, you know, Dominic Ansel or, you know, like these, these sort of figures that rise, you know, David Chang, that like rise out of food because I think in those cases, it's typically because they have added some form of contribution, right? Like the way in which David Chang talks about a lot of things is because he was sort of changing the way that people think about certain types of food. And therefore there was a legacy that was left behind, right? Both like, like his concepts of like ugly, delicious, or like understanding umami bombs across different cultures and the relationship with umami to different food, right? Like he has made some form of contribution to sort of the canon of food. And that's what elevates you outside of being sort of like a, an everyday food creator to having like actually contributed something. And in the same way, right? Like the, the, the middle realm seems to be filled by the content creators and, and whether or not there's like a question of, are you valuing fame or the consumption of your content versus like, what are you leaving behind? Because right. He's, you know, Pashman is creating a weekly podcast that people maybe love and have a relationship with him. But when he stops making that show, will the, the, (laughs) you want a purple one? Okay. We're getting more fruit snacks, but when he stops making the show, will, you know, will that have been some significant thing in the way that like, the art of cooking has contributed to the canon of cookbooks. See, and what I think you're touching on here is almost, and maybe you're not purposefully implying this, but like when you're talking about legacy or you're talking about the canon, it assumes that uh, the creator is imagining that that is the purpose behind the thing that they are doing when I don't know. In fact, I, I imagine in my rough estimate of, zero quantitative support that that what ends up happening more often than not is that isn't the thing that is driving people to create in dan pashman's instance it wasn't like because i love food so much like i'm you know I, i'm devoted to like making my mark instead it was like i need to prove myself uh whether or not that becomes anything like i almost expect it won't um but he worked for three years to do it uh, versus what what legacy in canon is, in my mind, is what people then, like how you are evaluated by the success of the thing you created. Like if it was good, you know, the art of cooking, joy of cooking, which one are we? The joy of about? cooking, yeah. The joy, joy of, of cooking, cooking has, has lived on because of its quality and then could elevate its creator accordingly. Uh, and Although she is like not elevated, not a household name, can't even recall her name, even though she's mentioned in like every one of Ruth Reichel's books. You know who I'm? I'm mixing it also with mastering the art of French cooking, Julia Child. That would be Julia Child. Mm. But I did watch a series of videos this morning of Jacques Pepin making different styles of omelet. Just an aside, <laughs> he's so charming. <laughs> <laughs> I need to watch that. You would like it. It was about the textural and technique differences between a classic French omelet and a country omelet. What is Largely it? The the curd size, mm. the level of browning, and the viability of ingredients. Mm. Smaller curds, only, more browning. Only a few v- ingredients. No browning, no browning on a classic French omelet. That makes sense. Very small curds. Right. Only a couple of herbs permitted as mm. ingredient. Country omelet, get it brown, larger curds, stuff it if you want. Lots of ingredients are viable. Anyway, back to back to the topic at hand. Yeah, I mean, there there is like an interesting thing that you point out here too, where like as we're talking through it, people who sit on both sides of this have sort of in some way contributed to the canon, right? Like 
who have created content that is last, right? Like the joy of cooking or the art of French cooking or, you know, Jake and G Lopez alt the food lab or, or things like this that are sort of significant books where those people were also cooks, but weren't cooking for people in like restaurants or, or anything like that necessarily. But the, there is this other idea um, where there's sort of like the grass is always greener type of, of mentality. And it gets talked a lot about in rappers versus basketball players. Like rappers want to be basketball players. Basketball players want to be rappers um, <laughs> in the way that they like, um, you know, like really good examples are Damian Lillard is a, elite basketball player for the Portland Trailblazers, but he's also a rapper has put out like beef tracks and like has songs available under the name Dame Dalla. And Drake is a rapper who really wants to be a basketball player, like shows up at all the games was a big figure when the Toronto Raptors won the championship of like being on the sidelines. Like he just wants to be, and they're like both, at the peak of their powers and the things that they do and want to be the other thing. Can I tell you what my favorite magical overlap between those categories is? Yes. Men who talk about with pride wanting to buy their mother's houses. (laughs) Gets right to the soft and gooey part. This is the center of the Venn diagrams. That is the middle of the Venn diagram. For me. Just for me. But this feels like it, in this case, Dave, Dave Pashman, is that right? Dan, 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 Pashman. Dan, Dan Pashman is sort of like doing that thing. Like he reached an extreme level of notoriety. I don't know how many people listen to a show, but it's a lot, right? Like a, not an insignificant amount of people listen to a show and he's created a lot of it and then maybe it's gotten easy. And so some of it, it maybe is about like a sort of creation of a challenge to like break into an area where you don't have it and whether or not then the question of contribution at least as he had sort of oriented around it maybe is not right necessarily jesse you may be more you may be more better positioned to comment on this than i am because i didn't go tremendously deep but there's a there's a, a snippet that's sticking out to me from the content that I had um, consumed around the story, which was like they interviewed the Planet Money folks, or no, it was a snippet from his own podcast where he was interviewing his wife about her experience of him pursuing this pasta shape where she was like, I got to be honest with you, like, I don't love it. It's taking a lot out of you. It's low-key ruining our family life. I'm tired. It costs a lot of money. Um, You probably would have been much more successful if you had just launched another podcast. Like, could you get off of this? And he was just like, nah. (laughs) Yeah, it was actually really sad. It was really sad to hear her say that. And it's flying off the metaphorical shelves. I mean, I don't even think it's made it to stores, but it's already sold out online. And the back order ship date is up to like four to six weeks. I can't, I can't get my hands on it. Yeah, but have you had the Sfoglini? I'm, I'm butchering that so bad. But mm-hmm. that brand of pasta I actually had discovered weeks ago yeah. at the Whole Foods. That's some artisanal pasta. And it is fancy and delicious yeah it's like just i think this din, 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 that that's me strumming my ukulele i can't i don't have that <laughs> musical ability insert alex insert ukulele this brings us to your question 1b i think jess yeah i don't even i can't even wrap up that corner because we have to move on because there's a second question at hand I'm really glad that you brought this topic to our attention, Katie, because I, too, as evidenced by my participation, listened to the same NPR coverage of Dan Pashman's pasta story and was immediately inspired because the question of 
what is like if I could create a pasta shape, what would I want that to be was really exhilarating. And also a couple things came to mind. The first was, wow, I wonder if this would be a lot of pressure to put on at work if we were to have a, an icebreaker activity with people asking them to draw a pasta shape that doesn't exist. But more pressingly <laughs> was the second conclusion, which was I must do that right now for myself and make everyone in my household do the same thing. <laughs> I and so need I, to hold on. <laughs> so, I just need to tell you that Yes, it would be a lot of pressure, but last week we did run a workshop where we asked folks as the icebreaker to imagine that they needed to survive as a fruit and draw themselves as the fruit that would enable them to survive, which feels on the same page. Did you get a lot of thick pith? Honestly, we got so many different things, but a lot of Things with shells or skins, definitely. Mm. I go to pineapple. We did get a pineapple. We also got a, a dragon fruit. There were a handful of bananas, coconuts, oranges. Anything poisonous? No. No, that's a good one. Sorry, Anything that could be swallowed pasta. and then out, you know, comes out the other side and then becomes planted and then it grows anew in the second oh, life. Oh, that's a good one. So like a kiwi maybe? Or a berry. Or any kind of berry with <laughs> seeds. We digress. So let's imagine then in this tiny workshop of three, if I were to bring the same question to you, what is your ideal pasta shape, whether or not it exists? I've heard it told that a framework may exist to support me in the development of my pasta innovation journey. <laughs> yeah, there, there is a loose one. Um, I, will, I will offer this up forward for you and any of our listeners who now are, in, are trying to rack your brains figuring out what is my ideal pasta shape. That's a great question. For what it's worth, this is the perfect encapsulation of critical nonsense. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I agree. Hit if, it. if it were up to me, we'd pose questions like these all the time. But okay. <laughs> number one. See, Shade Queen. <laughs> <laughs> number one, a pasta is only as useful and tasty as the things that it is paired with. Part two is mouthfeel, and that includes texture as well as scale. Like, you sure. know, the fluted pasta versus like, do you like those tiny little orzo kinds or Ugh, like the no? I know. Get it out of here. Get out of here. Just be rice. If you <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, like another question for another day. At what point does rice become pasta? Like, I don't understand. At, wait, what is the difference between couscous and pasta? Yeah, like couscous Israeli is like pasta. pearl couscous. Because uh, anyway, what's the yeah? That's yeah. A that's Great part question. two, part three, part three, part next time of this conversation. Yeah. So, Joey, in recap, part one, pairings, part two, mouthfeel, and then part three is miscellaneous need space. Like, what is what is the missing link of pastas today that you can't get? And I maybe can offer you up some solace in my construction of an ideal pasta shape before forcing yes. you to do the same. Yeah, yes. do it. My favorite sauce pairing is a chunkier red meat sauce. And so I typically gravitate towards the likes of like a rigatoni type or a pipe rigate type noodle that's going to like hold the sauce. That's what I want in my sauce situation, my sauce pairing. Second, for mouthfeel, none of this slippery ZD business. Like I definitely want there to be some kind of like textural component to my pasta shape. You and need grab is what you're saying? Yeah, like, but not but not just like for the sauce's sake. No, but of, for your but mouth. For my mouth, exactly. Like I don't I don't want it to be like a slidey experience. Um yeah. and then the third of the the missing link, to me, I find that you usually have to choose between a pasta as described, like good at holding sauce, 
and like all of the things that is also able to be eaten in one fell swoop in like with a fork. Like sometimes mm. a rigatoni is like a rigatoni with all of the stuff is actually too big of a bite. Yeah. Right? And sometimes the the there's not like a good place to put the fork. Right? Like a rig like are you supposed to slot like thread it through the fork? Right. Or like, you're just like stabbing, stabbing it aggressively and like hoping that the bite turns out okay exactly honestly so, what you want is like you want to be eating like a very chunky rigatoni bolognese with chopsticks and just like shoveling it yeah wow. Chop- like some people eat with chopsticks or a spoon which are o- the only two utensils we as humans ever need but <laughs> anyway so suffice it to say th- the result of this was coming up with what i called the the sea cucumber pasta which i don't know the french name for Italian? The, Itali- the Italian name for, excuse me, um, where it's kind of like a rigatoni that slightly crimps in the middle, but not all the way. But it is the place where your fork is meant to be stabbed such that you can eat it in two bites. It is meant to be eaten bite one and bite two. And then it is designed for consumption. But anyway, I now open up the floor to your the, ideal pasta. The name talk. would be the Cetriolo. Cetriolo. I was Googling it too. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so one, one of my favorite pastas is orecchiette because Little of the ears. mouthfeel. The, there is like the chewiness of the pasta that I really like. I think that is like priority number one. Um, the pairing is is... I'm not crazy about like voluminous sauce. I want shocking. E- I want I want <laughs> distribution and hold. So I think some external texture is important to be able to hold, but I don't want it, you know, I don't want like gops of pasta or gops of sauce in my mouth. You're not looking for like the um the the tortilla chips that they turn into little baskets so you can scoop scoop salsa into them. You don't want that in your pasta shape? No, absolutely (laughs) not. Point of order, Joey, describe a sauce that fits this mold. I think, you know, like cacio e pepe. I knew that's where he was going. It's going to be like a cheesy, creamy thing. Or, um... Um, now Alfredo? I'm blanking. I mean, I like Alfredo, but it's not about the cheese part. Uh, the what is the egg one? Carbonara. 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 With the uh, yeah, where you can get a so coat. Viscous, I mean, I still like, but not dense. Yeah, yeah. I don't like the gloppiness of the of. Well, when the you say it like and, that, <laughs> yeah, I don't want like a large volume of sauce, but I want coating. So I want something to be able to hold the sauce, but I still want like 90% to be chewy in my mouth, not not I don't know why the ways you describe this of like gloppy coating (laughs) chew. (laughs) So visceral. (laughs) Katie, what are your attributes you're seeking in a pasta to to complement the other things? It's just like, it's so circumstantial. It really depends on the day. Like trying to make me choose between sauces is like asking me to pick one, a favorite of my imaginary children. Wow. Um, honestly, when you first started describing the framework, the pasta, the, the pasta dish that came to mind, which is Shocking, but maybe also like honestly perfect for me is that the pasta that came to mind is like midnight pasta or like, I don't, I don't know. That's like the, that's a colloquial term for it that I have heard, but it's like basically the pasta that chefs are making for themselves after working their shift at midnight. And it's like usually a long, a long pasta, the sauce Mm quote-unquote sauce is like olive oil red chili flakes lemon juice 
salt and you're probably showering it with some type of fresh cheese. It's like not even really a saucy pasta. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, More like so seasoned pasta. It is like seasoned it pasta. Sounds fire. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, a pasta shape like bucatini mm. or, um, or spaghetti or udon, honestly, mm, udon. sort of like toothsome long noodles yeah mm-hmm. um do a great job and Shang- I, I shanghainese think- udon is like fried udon in like a soy uh garlic type of sauce with mm. maybe like a little ginger or something and then uh it's with me served hungry. with like bok choy but it's like heavily mm. twosome it's completely coated but it's not like hanging down the the noodles are like thick and hearty like shanghainese udon is like fried udon is amazing the dream the dream here for that so yeah i think what i'm saying is that like i don't need a new vessel for Mm -hmm. the pasta of my dreams and also I'm extremely here for the pasta innovations of others. You're like yeah, you're ready like, in case it were to come your way. Yeah, I want I want them. And I think I'm not currently I'm not currently missing anything. But that's, you know, like I'm a little bit of a I walk I walk a tepid what's the word? I walk a line between sort of a desire for traditionalism and a desire for innovation. Like some days it's one thing and some days it's the other. <laughs> can can I close us with one last question that I know is just going to make Jess mad? <laughs> yes, okay. you may. What's the difference between pasta and noodles? You missed our, our conversation earlier where we were just talking about the difference between pasta and rice, which I know. I know, but like, Pasta what and is the difference noodles? between pasta and noodles? Okay, the difference to me, all noodles are pasta, but not all pasta are noodles. Noodles. Whoa. Whoa. Mm, yeah. Noodles have to be long and more likely than not are from the Asian continent. Or the Italian <laughs> subcontinent peninsula. I would call it pasta. But, like, spaghetti is then not a noodle? You'd call it pasta first, in my mind. Well, but you might. The, but, but, but growing up, I just called them noodles. Spaghetti is both a pasta and a noodle. Spaghetti Wait. is pasta. Spaghetti is a noodle. You know, actually, you bring up a great point. Noodles with butter could still be something like spaghetti. It's, gotta, also, it's just long. It's wait, long wait, wait, pasta. wait, wait, wait. Yeah? Noodles with butter could also be... I feel like noodles with butter especially in the Swedish tradition, is like flat, short egg noodles. Okay. Here's, here, I'm offering something up. What if it's about surface area and you need to have a critical surface area mass per noodle? in order for it to be called noodles, because what you describe, Katie, is flat enough to create more space per noodle. But the, the same could also be said for farfalle. <sighs> farfalle, the I, worst pasta to exist. I Whoa! love farfalle. Hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Turn down the heat. I, it, I, all, the, it, uh, according, according to some Canadian person online, countryguide.canada, um, <laughs> the difference is largely based on the ingredient. Noodles are usually made with flour milled from common wheat. Pasta is processed from durum semolina, which is coarser than typical flour. So the, the shape is not the factor, right? Like udon is, it has a different texture. It's, it's denser because of it probably is absorbing more water because the flour is finer when the udon is crafted versus like a spaghetti noodle, which is a little bit more brittle because it's t- 
typically crafted where did, from. Where does semolina. soba fall? Yeah, here. there's an erasure also of like other this types ra- of grains. That's a racist definition. <laughs> where are the rice noodles or like the buckwheat based oh, noodle? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I reject Whoa. this definition. R- <laughs> rice flour? I don't know. So then, right, so then are, just- are you suggesting that mochi is a noodle? No, but their <laughs> mochi is a flower. <laughs> Mochiko. Okay. I just can you can you can you quickly do a wrap up corner of this entire conversation? <laughs> can you just wrap this corner up? Thank you so much. Katie came to us with a very exciting tale of Dan Pashman's pasta creating journey. Uh, inspiring both a practical discussion about the valuation between one who creates something versus one who curates something, uh, but also taking us down this very silly road of what our dream pasta shape might be or whether it already exists out there. And all in all, this is the most critical nonsense you might have heard in a while. What is with the erasure of the last segment? (laughs) Get out! (laughs) We should have let you walk since the day you called Katie a cat Massachusetts cat lady. Cat lady. <laughs> With that, it's nonsense. Critical Nonsense is a Sylvain production. Sylvain, recorded wherever we are all over the place. Uh, we'd like to thank... Our special guest host, a cat lady in Massachusetts, Katie Sadow. <laughs> She's flipping me off right now. I'd like to thank the totally opposite of Farfalle and sound engineer Alex Contel and apologize in advance that this episode is going to be miserable to cut together. <laughs> We'd like to thank designer Nora Mestrich for all of her beautiful everything. <laughs> Oh, we'd like to thank Emerson and also Nora because she is the rigatoni of my heart. Oh, that's beautiful. And pasta, noodles, whatever you call them, we'd like to thank our production help from Sara Gilbert, Les Jacobs, and Tony Vong. And as always, sorry, Ellen. <laughs> uh, special thanks. I'd like to thank Emerson who has managed while we record this today to connive me into feeding her three bags of fruit snacks. And I'd also like to thank her for adorning your cranium (laughs) with the spectacular crown that we are witnessing at this moment. I feel like Emerson is really the primary special thanks. I have no one else I need to thank. (laughs) That's it. What, What if Alex somehow does his magic, we have to thank him. But what you won't be able to tell is that I've been in and out of my seat the entire recording chasing a two-year-old. So you're either going to hear that and now you know why and or Alex is wonderful and somehow made it fit together. Or Joey, what if our trailer this week is the episode and you're just (laughs) leaving? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm just completely cut out of it. (laughs) Anyway, thank you for listening. Tell us your pasta shapes. That's all I have. Yeah, tell us your pasta shapes. Okay, Thanks, Dan Pashman. Thanks. Bye, Katie. Okay, bye. bye. She just got two packs of fruit snacks, and she Yo. said she's having another another purple one, and I said no, and she said, yes, I am. <laughs> Look what you brought into the world. And I got some more. No more. You had three.